Today's guest bet big with his company on blockchain, made a fortune, lost it, and has come back from the brink. He says you can invest in crypto like a value investor. Episode 206 features Sir John Hargrave, publisher of Bitcoin Market Journal and author of Blockchain for Everyone. Overall, on average, in the last 100 years, the stock market has increased 10% per, per year. Now, with the block market, you're buying a token representing the value of a blockchain project. So you are not an owning anything. There's no company, there's no legal entity. All you own is this token, which again can go up or down. And like a stock, you can sell it at a price, uh, at, a, at a gain or at a loss. And hopefully you can hold valuable blockchains for the long term. And although it's extremely volatile, it's increased a thousand percent annually since 2013. I'm Andy Wong, host of the Inspired Money podcast and financial advisor at Runnymede Capital Management. Today, we're talking with Sir John Hargrave, CEO of Media Shower, publisher of Bitcoin Market Journal, and author of several books, including Blockchain for Everyone, How I Learned the Secrets of the New Millionaire Class, and You Can Too. He's also a sought-after speaker who says blockchain is the most important technology of our lifetime so far, and it's creating some of the biggest fortunes on the planet. In this episode, you'll learn how investing in the stock market and block market can be similar, yet very different. Potential applications of digital programmable money and blockchain categories, as well as an approach to allocating part of your portfolio to blockchain in a logical, methodical way. Now let's get inspired with Sir John Hargrave. John, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you, Andy. It's a pleasure to be here. It's going to be fun. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? <laughs> I had a paper route. Uh, and it was my first job. I delivered newspapers uh, for a little Ohio town called the Akron Beacon Journal. And uh, running a paper route is a great entrepreneurial experience for a kid because you have it all. You've got inventory, you've got accounts receivable, you got accounts payable and so forth. And what I found was the hardest part of that job was not getting up at four o'clock in the morning on Sundays to deliver the Sunday paper, which weighed five pounds. The hardest part was collecting the money from customers. <laughs> and that has uh, has really been a very useful experience as I have built a career as an entrepreneur. Did that include sales too? Did you have to do sales as well? You did. Yeah. So you had to go around to houses that were not currently receiving the Akron Beacon Journal and uh, ask if they wanted to sign up. And sometimes, you know, another paper uh, carrier would quit and you had the opportunity to kind of expand your your fledgling empire by taking over some of those uh, those houses as well. That That's really cool. So you are a comedy writer turned blockchain expert. Before we get into that, based on your name, Sir John, <laughs> Sir John, many would expect you to be a 70 year old British celebrity. Tell us why you legally changed your name and knighted yourself. Yeah, so uh, I started as a comedy writer, as you said, uh, and my uh, first book is called Prank the Monkey. And I was known for these uh, very uh, high concept pranks against some of the largest celebrities in the world. I decided for my uh, first book, I was going to prank the Queen of England. So I wrote uh, Her Majesty a letter and I basically said, uh, um, Your Highness, I would like to be knighted. And uh, I actually got a letter back from Buckingham Palace and they said, um, you have to actually do something uh, noble. And I said, well, that's a lot of work. So I uh, basically went down to the local county courthouse here in America where I live. And uh, for a small fee, you can pay to have your name legally changed so went before a judge, paid $75, and today here I am, Sir John Hargrave. <laughs> John, to what extent are you motivated by money? Because in my observation, 
you have a knack for getting in front of significant waves of change and have a willingness to go all in in hopes of benefiting financially. In your book, you became a dot-com millionaire by, I guess it was on your 30th birthday. So can you talk a little bit about pivoting and evolving and how do you position yourself to be in front of the right wave of change? Well, uh, it's a good question and that's a good observation. Uh, I have had a knack for making money and uh, part of that is being very future focused and understanding the waves of change that are coming in front of us and then having uh, the courage to, uh, to, to anticipate those waves of change, either by creating a business or making the right investments at the right time. But it also involves a great deal of uh, preparation and research to make sure, for example, if you think blockchain is the wave of the future, uh, to invest uh, in a wise way in these new blockchain investments so that you're not just throwing money um, after, after the poor quality investments. And that's a lot of the work that I do today is helping educate investors on, on this wave of change that's coming to money through blockchain, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and helping them think uh, in a smart way about how to benefit from that so they can achieve financial independence. Yeah, and back to the question of to what extent are you motivated by money? Because I think in your book, you also touch upon trying to figure out what your uh, higher purpose is too. Yeah. So how do those two things tie together? Yeah, great question. I am really focused on making the world a better place and living my highest good. And uh, I have a little, uh, a little, a little moleskin notebook, a little journal, um, and I write a little personal affirmation in it each time, each day, uh, fifteen times a day. And my current affirmation uh, is, "I am living my highest good. I'm living my highest good." And I do that again and again. And uh, in in my book, Blockchain for Everyone, I have like a little photocopy. Uh, of of one of those pages. So uh, the the idea of getting money really to me is in uh, in service of of living my highest good. It is in service of helping make the world a better place and really um, unleashing my full potential and helping others really tap into theirs. In your book, you talked about your higher good. Uh, Maybe you can tell us how you defined it there and has it changed? Yeah, it's changed a lot. So um, I wrote, I read a book, uh, I want to say about 15 years ago, a little book called uh, Think and Grow Rich, written in uh, the 1930s by this uh, self-help author named Napoleon Hill. Have you read it before, Andy? I have read it. Yes. So Think and Grow Rich had a big impact on me. And the basic concept was, well, our, our thoughts create things. So in other words, the mental attitude that we bring to life and that we bring to uh, our, our work uh, will affect the eventual outcomes uh, that we have. And I, I made it a mission of mine to really um, test that. So to test this theory and to say, is this true? If I think about these things in a positive way, if I think about creating wealth, if I think about making the world a better place, if I think about unleashing my highest good, will that actually come into being, number one? And number two, if it's true, how can I, uh, how, how can I improve my odds of success in that? In other words, are there specific techniques that I could use to think better, if you will? <laughs> And uh, out of those experiments came another book I wrote called Mind Hacking. And Mind Hacking is by far my, my, my best-selling book to date um, because it talks about reprogramming the mind like you're reprogramming a computer. But what I learned through those, uh, through those experiments is, yes, our, our minds absolutely do create our reality on some level. That's just common sense. Uh, but on another level, uh, what happens is that our notion of what's my highest good begins to evolve. So right after I read that book, I said, I'm going to, you know, uh, be going to build a, a net worth of X million dollars. Well, after I did that, I realized that's really not <laughs> the, the point of living. The point of living is to use that money in service of something else. 
And so my sense of what is possible and what I am called to do, what we're all called to do has grown and expanded over time. But that idea of highest good continues to evolve. And that's why I really like that specific thought, that specific affirmation. And it works really well for me. Yeah, I, I, I like that you that you sort of summarized the book by saying that you're living your highest good. And yeah. I think that you spelled it out. At that time, it was to make blockchain interesting and fun, to explain yeah. it in plain English, and really to educate the 99% of the world um, that it's safe in a sensible way um, because that also helps the entire blockchain ecosystem grow. Maybe you can take us through some slides. I know that you have a presentation that really outlines an investment strategy for people to invest in blockchain safely and sensibly. Yeah, I'm happy to do it. And this is the natural outgrowth of all of that work I've done, both the inner work, the mental work that we're talking about, but also the the, the external work and talking to many, many investors in this space and reading and researching a lot over um, the past uh, 10 years or so in this space and, and writing uh, my two books in blockchain, uh, Blockchain for Everyone and Blockchain Success Stories. So I will share this with you now. Uh, I believe you should be able to see this here. Good? Yep, looks good. Yeah, so um, basically I bought Bitcoin in 2013. Um, so this was about five years after I grew, th after I read Think and Grow Rich. Uh, and I was repeating those kind of mind hacks or those affirmations to myself. And my wife and I made this purchase uh, of Bitcoin, which at that time, the price of a single Bitcoin was about $125. So we were able to afford uh, a fair amount of, of uh, Bitcoin as this early investment. And what happened over the next uh, uh, several years, we held on to the Bitcoin and it grew and grew and grew. Uh, and by 2017, it had reached $10,000 per Bitcoin. So from 125 to 10,000, I said to my wife, this is the greatest investment <laughs> we have ever made. Uh, let's do even more. So we run a marketing uh, company, a media and communication company called Media Shower. And I said, let's pivot the company and go all in on Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. And uh, she said, you sure? <laughs> and I said, let's do it, baby. And she said, don't call me baby. So we went ahead and did this. We uh, went all in. We pivoted the company and things went really great for like three months. Uh, it went up to $19,000 and then the price of Bitcoin just tanked. And with it, this entire market of blockchain investing. Uh, and we ended up having to lay off most of our team. Uh, we had all of these uh, people defaulting on us. We weren't getting payments in the door. It was very dark. And then things went really bad. <laughs> it went down to about $4,000 over the next four years. We were down to our very last payroll. We had a second mortgage out on the house. It was bleak. Uh, and somehow we held in and we turned around the company. And today, uh, Media Shower is uh, better and stronger than ever. We built it all back. And along the way, we learned some valuable lessons. So just this year, that same Bitcoin has reached $60,000. A few weeks later, it was down to 37000 I think today it's around $50,000. So the first thing we learned is like Bitcoin is extremely volatile. And so the problem is when most people invest, quote unquote, in crypto, they end up buying a bunch of Bitcoin and then they just obsessively check the price. If the price has gone up, <laughs> they keep checking the price. And then when it goes down, inevitably, uh, the question is, are, are you scared? And once that pain gets bad enough, people sell and they vow never to go back to crypto again. So there is a better way. And what we've really taught people, just as we've learned with our company to diversify our company. So some of our clients now with Media Shower are crypto, maybe about a quarter of them, but the rest are more traditional finance and technology companies. And so that diversification of our company is what we teach when thinking about your personal investment. So basically, 
a traditional portfolio might be you know something like 60 percent stocks and 30 percent bonds and we talk about including a small slice of the pie um, in bitcoin or cryptocurrency assets you might think that this is your mad money or your alternative investments but basically you want to be able to participate in this amazing growth of this very exciting asset class but you don't want to bet the farm you don't want to put your kids college fund into bitcoin and crypto you don't want to do what we did and gamble your whole company on it and that's the great lesson the takeaway um, from our book from our experience and that that i hope uh, is helpful to your your listeners does that make sense that makes sense and i guess the very typical disclaimer still holds true past performance is no guarantee of future results but given how you've positioned your company and your brand i this is a loaded question but what inning do you think we're in well with bitcoin and cryptocurrency probably the first inning still because i think we are um we're, we're literally changing the global financial system. We're rebuilding the way that money it moves and is transferred. Uh, we're, we're remaking this idea of kind of nation states uh, owning their own currency in the United States, having the, the global reserve or default currency uh, to becoming something that's much more global in nature because obviously we live in a global economy. We live in a, a global interconnected world where the economy of one nation is just inextricably intertwined with, with everyone else. And so our money is starting to reflect that in the same way that the internet, um, you know, 25 years ago, 30 years ago, started to uh, make information global. Uh, so we often call blockchain the, 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 the internet of value that we're starting to use those same principles of global sharing of information for the sharing of money itself. So I think we're still really early days. That's why this industry is so exciting and why it's such an exciting time to be alive. And like the value of being a futurist or having a forward looking view, how extreme of a vision do you have when it comes to blockchain and money? Is it a case of you have peer-to-peer -peer transactions and you no longer need like countries and the governments? Or is it something kind of more middle of the road where, as you mentioned, you do have like a national currency for each country, but tied to blockchain and the countries are also involved? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. So I think we will continue to have countries and nation states, certainly for our, our lifetimes. <laughs> and I think they will also have their own sovereign currencies. Uh, but I think there is emerging a global currency that will supersede all of these. Uh, and that will be based on blockchain technology. Um, some think it will be Bitcoin. Uh, I think maybe it could be Bitcoin, but it will be something like Bitcoin. And uh, the way the analogy I use is you can have national government um, at the same time as you have a local government. So we could have an international money, right, at the same time as we still have a U.S. dollar and a euro and yen and so forth. So I think uh, it will evolve into something that supersedes or is larger than any one country. And uh, that's very exciting. We haven't had anything like that except maybe gold, I guess, uh, in, in human history. But this is, this is different from gold in many ways in that it's not a, a physical substance. It's, uh, it's digital. And that's, that's cool. John, in your opinion, where does the U.S. stand today relative to China and then other countries? Uh, I think we are a laggard uh, when it comes to the adoption or even understanding of digital currency. So China, I believe, has been working on a digital currency since around 2007, 2008. So that's a long time. That's that's as long as Bitcoin has been around. And China currently has a central bank digital currency is what it's called, a CBDC. And all that means is it's a digital version um, of the Chinese currency that uh, that citizens can hold in their digital wallets and spend like traditional currency. 
And uh, the benefits of a central bank digital currency are enormous. Um, if the government needs to make uh, payouts like the recent stimulus check that could go directly to citizens digital wallets instead of mailing checks out to everyone. Uh, if you have government funds, let's say social security or Medicare or welfare payments, et cetera, those can go directly to digital wallets. And it tremendously helps the unbanked because if everyone has a digital wallet and the cost of holding that digital wallet is free and it's free to disperse funds to those digital wallets, you run, uh, you, you greatly help people who um, are not profitable for banks to service. So there are many reasons that we need this CBDC, which I see as inevitable. Uh, I think it's going to happen probably within the next two to three years, I hope, uh, because I think once people really start to understand how far ahead China is, it's going to kick off a kind of currency war and there's going to be a great rush to, uh, to, to make something happen um, on the digital dollar front quickly. I'm going to link in the show notes to an open letter that you wrote to Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. I think that that encompasses a lot of uh, a lot of this topic of the things that you're talking about and is very interesting and well written. Um, it sounded like with with the digital currency, if the government could also issue stimulus checks with conditions like you could only yeah. spend it on certain things. Yes. Great point. It's really interesting with digital currency that it's programmable. It's programmable money. And once you start to think in those terms that programmable money could have like conditions built into it before you'd receive a payment, that's very interesting. Uh, so there's all kinds of things you can do with programmable money, this do digital dollar, digital currency, as you said, uh, if you're receiving an unemployment check, through digital dollars, you might have to provide proof, you know, that you've been out job hunting as you have to do with uh, with traditional uh, unemployment payments. Uh, you know, if you are receiving some kind of government assistance, you might assistance, you might have to provide proof of of uh, your your current income and so forth. And all that could be uploaded and handled in software, handled in code, handled in apps. And through the very seamless, easy internet based thing, instead of calling unemployment offices, waiting in line, <laughs> filling out endless bureaucratic forms, and so on. That's powerful. The idea is mind blowing because we know yeah. the challenges of government and bureaucracy. And if you could have digital contracts or smart contracts that are sort of self regulating. Um, yeah. They can just be extremely effective. Yeah, in the book, I, I give a lot of examples. Uh, this is blockchain for everyone. Um, in, in that book, I give a lot of examples of um, how these digital currency smart contracts, this idea of programmable money, could be used in everyday transactions. For example, if you own a house and you're getting your, your roof finished, um, you could put money into an account that's sort of like an escrow account for your roofer. So the roofer gives you an estimate of $15,000. You put it in the account. The roofer knows that you're good for it because that money is sitting in an account, but it's not going to be released to the roofer until you both agree that this is the job has been finished and finished well. And then you both scan a QR code and that releases these digital dollars over to the roofer, right? So there's lots of examples of things that we can't even imagine yet um, that will be possible through this kind of programmable money or digital dollars. Do you want to continue with your slides? I'm guessing that you also show some, uh, I think, different portfolios and probably some numbers looking historically and what kind of impact a blockchain allocation would have. Yeah, sure. So, so you know, our philosophy in in doing this, Andy, is basically similar to the the great you know benjamin graham who who uh inspired warren buffett taught him how to invest this was his classic book called the intelligent investor and he basically talked about like when you buy a stock and here we're talking about traditional investing in traditional stocks traditional companies um that you're buying a company think about it like you're an owner of the company and so to do that you want to analyze or evaluate many companies many stocks to find a few that are really valuable Hopefully they're on sale, hopefully they're undervalued, hopefully you can buy, buy low and sell high. Um, 
again, diversifying your investments, as we discussed at the beginning, and thinking long term. And this is the biggest takeaway for people investing in blockchain is don't look to get rich quick, but look to get rich and make it stick. Now, our work has been about taking these principles of value investing and applying them to this new world of blockchain. And I know Warren Buffett hates Bitcoin, but here we're going to have to diverge in opinion and figure out a way of applying these principles to, uh, to this new space. And because it's so similar to the stock market, we call this blockchain world of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies the block market. So in, in the stock market, um, you know, you have these p public companies that you're investing in. In the block market, you have what are called coins or tokens or cryptos or cryptocurrencies. The grown up term for these, we think, is digital assets probably what they'll be called long term. So we call them digital assets. Um, and if you go to a website like CoinMarketCap, you'll see a listing like this that even looks like the stock market with ticker symbols and your daily market capitalization and things like that. But it is similar in some ways and it is different in other ways. And so understanding that, you know, in the stock market, again, you are literally a partial owner of a legal entity of a company. And the idea is to find these valuable companies early on and hold on to them while their stock price appreciates. And then if you want to sort of diversify further, you can just hold the entire stock market. So get an index fund that just invests in all the stock company, all the companies, because overall, on average, in the last 100 years, the stock market has increased 10% per, per year. Now, with the block market, you're buying a token representing the value of a blockchain project. So you are not an owning anything. There's no company. There's no legal entity. All you own is this token, which, again, can go up or down. And like a stock, you can sell it at a price, uh, at, a, at a gain or at a loss. And hopefully you can hold valuable blockchains for the long term. And although it's extremely volatile, it's increased a thousand percent annually since 2013. A thousand, a thousand percent. So as you said, that's the past. We don't know what the future is going to look like. But you can see here that if you would put $100 um, into the stock market three years ago, that's when my book was published and when we, um, when we put out these portfolios, uh, it would have grown about 50%. So again, that's been really great growth over the last three years. We've had a few good years. But if you put that same $100 into Bitcoin, in just three years, it would have grown 735%. So you can see for yourself, the numbers don't lie, the uh, tremendous opportunity there is to invest in these assets now. But again, it's extremely volatile. So that's what we want to do is try to uh, balance the risk of those. So quickly, the portfolio uh, that we've put together, this, this is what we call the, the, the non-believer portfolio. This would just be basic stocks and bonds, you know, kind of a plain vanilla portfolio of maybe two thirds stocks and one third bonds. And you can put them into a total stock market index fund like a Vanguard's and a total bond market index fund. So this is not very controversial. I would say this is uh, it's what most financial advisors might recommend. But what we've done, as I said at the beginning, is put a small slice of that into Bitcoin. So this one is our, our baby believer portfolio. This has two and a half percent in Bitcoin. Um, and then we have what we call a big believer portfolio that puts up to 10 percent um, in, uh, in crypto. And here we just have it um, into Bitcoin and Ethereum, the top two projects. So when we look at those uh, all next to each other and then compare the performance of those um, over the last uh, three years, um, you'll see that the uh, that ten thousand dollars put into the non-believers in three years would have grown to about seventeen thousand into the baby believers, so that's 2.5% Bitcoin, would have grown to about 19,000. And big believers, that's 10% um, into um, Bitcoin Ethereum, would have grown to $25,000. And you've done this without adding a tremendous amount of risk to your portfolio either. Make sense? That makes sense. And is this the strategy or the platform that makes you believe that blockchain is truly a way to lift people out of poverty? Well, I think that this is a good way for people to 
uh, invest in something that has long-term potential that is not uh, currently recognized or understood by kind of the mainstream financial establishment. So if you were to go to a financial advisor, most financial advisors today uh, would kind of probably look at Bitcoin with some amount of suspicion. Very few of them would be able to put together an investment thesis like the one that I'm sharing with you here. So in that sense, it is a way of catching some of this wave of this tremendous growth that we've seen in this space. But at the same time, it's so volatile that you don't want to put too much in this right away. You want to do it instead on a steady drip or kind of monthly auto withdrawal type, uh, type dollar cost averaging approach. So you're putting a little bit in each month and again, splitting it out, you know, maybe 60% into uh, stocks and maybe 30% into bonds and maybe 10% into crypto assets each month. Over time, that is going to help ordinary people build worth uh, and build wealth. Now, longer term, we hope that it will start to help the unbanked and some of these technologies will really bring this open to an, an even wider population as well. But that's going to that's going to you know require all of us to start investing in it and, and putting our money where our mouth is. Well, I agree 100 percent with you that the financial establishment I'm a financial advisor and I, I I have to admit that it's difficult for me to own Bitcoin or a specific cryptocurrency in my clients' accounts purely on the volatility because yeah. I would say I would go as far as saying that perhaps it's the most volatile asset class there is uh, compared to you know traditional uh, stocks, bonds, other commodities. I think that um, digital cur digital currency has been the most volatile, and there is a there is a responsibility to be prudent. And can I, if if it, if a client's portfolio went down substantially because of their Bitcoin position, uh, to what extent can I uh, can I explain that? It was one suitable suitable for them, but also prudent for them. But I like the way that you're taking kind of time tested investment approaches and value approaches, and include and including a small percentage in Bitcoin, in other cryptos, and then uh, you should also mention that you include some stocks in there as well uh, that benefit from blockchain. Yeah, thank you for pointing that out. And so, yeah, the, the there are specific companies that either specialize in blockchain. So, for example, Coinbase is a company that recently went public that is one of the, the largest uh, cryptocurrency exchanges, if not the largest. So you can invest in that as a publicly traded stock. Um, another company called Circle uh, is slated to become a publicly traded company. Um, in December 2021, depending on when you're listening to this. And uh, they're a very interesting company that's creating um, a cryptocurrency uh, called USDC, which is called a stable coin, very important for this whole crypto ecosystem. And then there are companies that kind of operate um, as um, what we might call picks and shovels for this gold rush. So a good example there would be NVIDIA. So NVIDIA makes these graphics cards uh, that are able to do mathematical calculations really fast in computers. And they're used for these Bitcoin mining computers, which are the computers that kind of hold together the Bitcoin network. So NVIDIA was one of our earliest recommendations. Um, it's in my book, actually, that has just exploded over the last few years for, for many other factors besides Bitcoin mining. Um, but those are the kinds of companies that we can still get exposure to this exciting new asset class uh, without necessarily buying and holding Bitcoin specifically. Well, I've got to, um, I, I have to give you praise for your book. I, I actually, Bitcoin, uh, blockchain, blockchain for everyone. I actually borrowed it from the library, put it on request because it wasn't in my local library, had to get it delivered to my library. It came while I was on vacation, so I could not pick it up. And so my my alternative while I was away was to listen to Audible. And I listened to the 
audible version, the audio book, and very much enjoyed that because you narrated it. And it had music and sound effects. Uh, it was very well done. Uh, I'm I so glad that. you did that. And thank you for that kind comment. We're really proud of the audio book. We really wanted it to be like a, like a radio play. Uh, and so we put a lot of work into the production of that and I play all the characters. So that's where my kind of comedy writing uh, uh, history comes into that because we really do write it in the form of a story that's just crazy roller coaster called Bitcoin and cryptocurrency and betting my company on it, losing it all and then and then building it all back. And it was a lot of fun to do. We've gotten just great feedback from the audiobook. So thank you. In your book, you have this recurring event of you sitting down with your buddies playing poker and discussing what's happening to your Bitcoin and some of your friends uh, being more skeptical. And I wanted to bring that up because should investors treat Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies more like a commodity? Because you're not able to do like a price to earnings ratio or talk to a company management and understand what's driving their earnings for the next three to five years. And what are some of the metrics that people should be looking at or can look at? Yeah, let me let me just share quickly the, the final uh, part of this uh, presentation, because oh, sure. I think this, this answers some of those questions. And I think this is very important. If you're going to invest beyond just Bitcoin and Ethereum, which are the two big the two biggest uh, crypto projects. You really want to think about both quantitative and qualitative uh, research on these crypto projects before you put any money into them at all. And the first principle we talk about is network effects. And that's just basically the idea that the more people who join a network, the more valuable that network becomes. So if you have a telephone, for example, you have two telephones, not very valuable, but as you add more telephones, the number of connections grows not linearly, but uh, quadratically, some people say exponentially. So you can see um, that how quickly this, this grows. And, and so as users grow linearly, that value of the overall network goes like this. And this is why some of the most valuable companies today are network companies. So Facebook, uh, Twitter would be examples of network companies. Now, blockchains are all networks. Um, so they all benefit from this network effect. And so one of the most effective metrics to look at um, would be the number of users and also how quickly they're growing. So um, there are, and, and what's cool about blockchain is this is all transparent. So if you wanna find out how many, <laughs> how many users Facebook has, you gotta wait for like their quarterly earnings report. And then it's like, by that time, it's already out of date. But blockchain, you can see it in real time. So this is a site called Dune Analytics. And the nature of blockchain is, is all this stuff is, is being updated in real time. So these are some of the top uh, projects right now. And these are very hot investments. One of them is called Uniswap. I, I hold Uniswap, full disclosure, um, compound one inch set. And you can kind of see their user growth and see that some of them are growing very quickly. Some of them have kind of reached a plateau and some of them are, are growing much more slowly. So this is the first thing you can you can do to kind of get a sense of that. But then you can take those number of users from those charts and look at your total market capitalization and divide the market cap by active users to get a value per user. And this is how some people um, uh, value other network companies like, like Facebook, for example. And so you can just right away see from some of these top crypto projects that, that some of these are probably extremely overvalued and, and some of them um, maybe undervalued or, or probably a combination um, of the two. So again, you know, using these simple reporting tools, um, block explorers, which are just ways that you can um, look at these blockchains um, and, and the kind of current metrics, and then just creating these simple metrics can be one good way of, of starting to value these blockchains. So, so that's the that's the quantitative, and then on the qualitative side, um, we've created this thing called the Blockchain Investor Scorecard, and this is free. Um, you can just Google Blockchain Investor Scorecard um, and and download it. And basically, what it does is has it asks in five different categories a number of questions, maybe like fifteen or twenty questions about this project. And what you're trying to do here is give each uh, each category, uh, a rating of between one and five, and then you 
you add them all up and you, you average it out so that you ultimately get, get a final score. And this lets you analyze m different blockchain projects against each other because crypto projects are all totally different. Some of them are like, you know, for file sharing applications and some of them are meant to be used as digital money and some of them are meant to be used in healthcare. So you need some way of kind of measuring them against each other. And that's why we created this scorecard. It's peer reviewed, it's been academically published and just used, I mean, downloaded thousands of times from our site. So, so this is kind of the, the quantitative side of that. We unpack this more on our website, at Bitcoin Market Journal, and it's in the book as well. Um, and the quantitative and the qualitative together um, can be a really powerful uh, a twins of investing for choosing choosing these projects. Can you talk a little bit about that value of community? Clearly, it has an application to blockchain, but it sounds like through your mentors, you also apply this to your business too. Yeah, well... Uh, community is is a big thing in the blockchain space because again that comes back to your number of users and it's trying to achieve these network effects. So um, a lot of people again look look at crypto and they say you know what's the price and what do I think the price is going to be and they really base all their decisions on price. And we flip that model on its head and we say you really want to look at users and the users are both people who are actually using the blockchain product whatever that is. Um, how many people are using, how fast are they growing, but then surrounding that, what is the community like? And the community would be things like, you know, maybe they have a discord channel. <laughs> so you can kind of see that's like the hardcore users, the people who are really into this, this blockchain token or project. You can look at things like Twitter and see how many people are mentioning on there. You can look at websites like Reddit, like social media websites, see, do they have a dedicated subreddit or community there? And by putting those together, we sometimes call them power users, these community users. And that can be kind of a good secondary metric for seeing, well, what is the strength of this, this community or this user base that's involved with this? This is very much like the early days of the internet where you had so many projects you know, in the early days competing for those users. And the way technology works is that you usually end up with one or two big winners in each uh, industry or sort of in each class. So like with e-commerce, obviously we ended up with, with Amazon and with auctions, we ended up with eBay and with search, we ended up with Google. So what we're trying to do right now as investors in blockchain is figure out number one, what are the sort of categories that are going to shake out over time? And number two, who are going to be the, the one or maybe two winners of each of those categories? And looking at users is a very powerful way uh, of, of figuring that out. And this is my last slide I'll share with you. This is something that was just uh, put out um, on uh, the uh, subreddit, our cryptocurrency. Uh, the, the user's name is War Gizmo. I'll, I'll give him credit for that. And what he's done is basically sorted cryptocurrencies into categories. So this would be like sectors in traditional financial investing. If you wanted to, you know, uh, buy an investment in the IT sector, for example. So as you look through these categories, you know, with financial services, which ones are going to be the winners uh, of that long term? And right now, the the companies that are at the top of each of these columns are pretty much the ones that are are kind of in the lead for each of those categories. So again, still do your quantitative and your qualitative research, but to try to boil the ocean of thousands of cryptocurrencies out there, looking at just the top, uh, the top coin in each of these categories is a really good place to start. That's helpful because yes, absolutely. The number of cryptos is overwhelming. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned stable coin, and I don't want to let that pass. What do people need to know about stable coins? Stable coins are a specific uh, kind of cryptocurrency that always hold their value. Um, usually, uh, one stable coin is worth one dollar. So, as opposed to Bitcoin, which, as we've said, could fluctuate from sixty thousand dollars to thirty thousand dollars in a couple of weeks, a stable coin is meant to always be worth one dollar, day in and day out. And so many people ask, why do you need that? Why would you want that? But there's a lot of reasons. 
And the biggest reason is when you move money into this new kind of digital financial system, um, we often talk about the traditional financial system and the digital financial system. So you've got a US dollar and then you go buy a stable coin called US dollar coin. And now you have kind of a one-to-one -one equivalent of that money, but it's in the blockchain space. It's in the digital or cryptocurrency world. And once it's digital, that US dollar coin can now be traded for Bitcoin or anything else. So it's very useful for people who are making a lot of trades or buying and selling. It's kind of a place to park your money in the digital system, as opposed to constantly moving it back and forth between the traditional and digital world, because it is expensive. There's a service fee every time you got to move it over. So for that reason, it's really important. And it's one of the fastest growing um, areas of, of uh, cryptocurrency are these stable coins. But it's not the kind of place where you can easily make money uh, because obviously it's, it's holding its value uh, every day. But you can see here in the stable coins list, the top stable coins to date, and I would say Tether and US, US dollar coin, USDC, are probably the two biggest ones today that, that are kind of duking it out. And Circle, the company that we mentioned earlier that's going to go public, is the one that uh, is issuing US dollar coins. A very interesting company to watch. Do you think that Bitcoin and some of the other altcoins are too volatile to, to use? as currency? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. So the, you know, the famous story um, in my book is, is the, uh, the, the two pizzas. It was the first purchase of Bitcoin to early enthusiasts when the price was just a, a few cents. They decided to make a purchase using Bitcoin and they just chose 20,000 Bitcoin um, just arbitrarily. And today that would be worth many hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and so uh, there's so many stories like that of people buying things in the early days with their Bitcoin and today the price is appreciated and they're kicking themselves. So for that reason, they're not effective, even though we call them cryptocurrencies, they're not really effective as currencies. However, these stable coins that we just talked about, um, those are effective as currencies once we get kind of our payment systems upgraded. So Circle is working with a lot of um, payments networks like Visa, um, and I believe they just made a deal with MasterCard to basically start to integrate US dollar coin with those payment systems. And again, that's a big deal because we're, we're really now starting to merge this traditional financial world with the digital financial world, um, which again, to me is inevitable. It's just how it's all going to play out exactly. That's, that's so fun and exciting. Well, thank you, John. Thanks for putting it into plain English for all of us and putting it into terms that more people can understand. Uh, thank you for bringing blockchain to everyone. I'd like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Uh, you know, my one of my heroes is uh, Ray Dalio, uh, who uh, founded the Bridgewater Capital, wrote a great book called Principles. Uh, and I think the way he defines it is, you know, success is is doing really interesting work with people that you love. Uh, and, and I feel the same way. I feel that the work we're doing is so interesting. It's so fascinating. It's intellectually stimulating. Um, but we're also helping people, you know, get, get in charge of their finances and build long-term wealth and, and learn and educate themselves in this space. And so fortunate to do this both with my wife, who's a character in the book, but also just a terrific team that we have at Media Shower and Bitcoin Market Journal. And uh, that's, that's success to me. It's great. Well, Bitcoin Market Journal is a great source for people to learn more. Uh, I like that when you go to the homepage, you can see the pricing, too. So you can track <laughs> prices as well as, um, you know, recent news and see what's happening in the space. Do you have any other resources that you recommend to people? Um, there is, uh, again, our, our uh, investor scorecard uh, is something that is free to download at, uh, at uh, Bitcoin Market Journal. You can just Google blockchain investor scorecard. Um, and then we have a free daily newsletter as well uh, that reaches about uh, 50,000 blockchain investors today. So I um, hope you'll sign up for that. I write a column for that every Friday, and then we have a number of other terrific columnists um, that, that put out a daily newsletter to help you make sense of, of this new world, again, from, this, from the uh, perspective of, of value investing. 
Well, again, once, once again, it's the power of community. So you have your readership on the daily newsletter as well as Bitcoin Market Journal. John, can you tell the Inspired Money listener and viewer where to follow you and get more information? Yeah. So uh, in addition to Bitcoin Market Journal, you are free to follow me on Twitter or LinkedIn. I do accept uh, all LinkedIn requests, so happy to connect with you there. And uh, don't forget, if you have enjoyed this podcast, they put a lot of work into this. So please leave a comment or share or give it a thumbs up or a positive rating because Andy works hard at this and it does provide a lot of value and it matters. Your feedback matters. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. And uh, everybody, Sir John Hargrave. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? Like a surfer watches for the right wave to catch the best ride? Looking for big waves of change can be opportunities to create wealth quickly. Keep your eyes and ears open, like John, and be ready to move. Of course, learning from experience, one of John's biggest lessons is not to bet everything, or you'll risk going boom and bust. Allocate in measured amounts, be willing to dollar cost average, and be consistent. The payoff can be significant over time. If you had a different favorite Inspired Money moment, let me know by posting a comment below. For watching to the end, I want to send you this Inspired Money sticker. Go to inspiredmoney.fm Andy, send me your name and address, and I'll put the sticker in the mail for you. Thank you so much for joining me on this mission. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.